everyone. Welcome again to another session of Rusty Allen's Virtual Fan Club, where we will be talking about my career path and more specifically, how I met Larry Graham. But before we get into that, let me introduce to you my co-host, my partner, my friend and bandmate, Mr. Levi Caesar Jr. What's up, people? How y'all doing? Good to see you again. Good to see Rusty again. Yes, sir. We're going to get into it. We're glad y'all online, checking it out. Uh, remember, Rusty got some new music coming, too. I'm trying to promote everything. We're on a budget. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he got some new music coming out. It's funky, it's slamming. So uh, stay tuned to all, everything we post is stay tuned to it. All right, Rusty. Right on. So, yeah, um, so um, let me um, just go back a little bit to where uh, we're talking about at the pinnacle of Sly and the Family Stone success. They had just did Woodstock. Uh, the Riot album was out, which they just celebrated 50 years of that uh, release. And uh, everything was great. And uh, at that point, Freddie, Rose, Cynthia, and Larry bought homes in the Oakland Hills. And if you know anything about Oakland, 98th Avenue turned into Golf Links Road. And on that side is where uh, Cynthia on Sequoia View and Rose bought a home on Sequoia View. And if you go up 106th Avenue, 106 goes straight up the hill to Malcolm Avenue. And Freddie and Larry was on that side. Wow. Yeah, so they bought homes up there. And, uh, you know, uh, prior to that, Willie Sparks, Willie Wild Sparks, who ended up playing drums with Grand Central Station, he came to my house one night and said, man, we want you to play in our band, right? And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so... Mm -hmm. So uh, we joined forces, and uh, at that time, Freddie had kind of like, kind of adopted Willie like a uh, cousin slash brother slash you know whatever. So so Willie was actually living at the house up there with Larry. Oh, okay. So we go up there and we start playing and we start practicing and David Stallings got in the fold and uh, you know we started playing little funk things and everything and Freddie would be on the road most of the time, so we'd be up there alone. So uh, one day Freddie came home and we were up there playing and uh, he kind of like liked what we were doing and everything. So he decided to get involved and started writing songs for us. And little did I know I was getting groomed for Little Sister, but I didn't even know, realize it at the time. Well, I'm just up there playing. So, you know, Freddie started writing for us and everything. So one day Willie was like, hey man, let's go down to Larry's house. And I'm like, Larry who? <laughs> and he said, Larry Graham. I said, really? He said, yeah, let's go down to Larry's house. I said, okay, all right. No, Nobody had a car, so we were walking mm -hmm. through the hills. And, you know, at that time, <laughs> you know, amplifiers uh, and that, yeah, and at that time, <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, that that neighborhood was predominantly white. So oh, yeah. so me and David and Willie, we were walking around the neighborhood and, you know, looking like burglars or something. Yeah, a lot of trees. And <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, what are these guys doing up here? But we had destinations. So, yeah, so we ended up walking down to Larry's house and uh, knocked on the door and chocolate answered the door. Chocolate. That's his wife? Yeah, that was chocolate. That one used to sing with Graham Central Station. But she was, they were married? They were married at the okay. time. He had his own chocolate. Yeah, okay. he had his own. The chocolate factory. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so she answered the door and uh, she knew Willie, but she didn't know us. So she was like, well, wait a minute. So she closed the door. Then a couple of minutes, she came back. She said, okay, come on in. So we went in, and we went into Larry's music room. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in those days, you know, like, you know, the equipment that you guys recording with uh, makes the stuff that they were using ancient, you know, just dinosaur, just yeah. uh, obsolete because they had Sony sound on sound reel to reels with quarter inch tape. Analog. Everything was analog, yeah. not digital. But, but you know yeah. the home but the home studios was like Sony sound on sounds with quarter inch tape, reel mm -hmm. to reel. Oh okay. So you could like, you know, like overdub maybe four tracks with gotcha. one of those. Okay. So he had a couple of those in the house and he had them linked up. And uh so we went in and Larry finally came in the room and you know, he was cool, and we, I'm just like awestruck, like, this is Larry Graham, mm. this is like, you know, yeah, the yeah. funkiest dude in the world. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. Big he, moment. You know, yeah, so he came in, and so uh, he picked up the bass, right, and he started playing this bass line. It was just like straight killing. I'm like, wow. So 
He was like, so what's your name? And I told him my name. He's like, can you play? And I was like, I think so, a little bit. And so he handed me the bass, right? He said, play that. So I started playing it, right? And then his eyes got kind of big and he started smiling. And then that's when he turned around and started turning on the tape recorders, <laughs> you oh, know. Okay. So You were worthy of being taped. Yeah. <laughs> something happened, you know. And wow. so, you know, so he started giving, he gave David a guitar part and gave me a bass line and you know, he had those rhythm kings up there at the time. So, you know, mm -hmm. Willie didn't have nothing to do but really just kind of programmed a rhythm king. Yeah. And we started playing these little funk things, man. And man, it was just absolutely just mind blowing how how his creative uh, flow was, man. And how he would come up with these bass lines and these guitar parts and all that stuff would just fit so beautifully, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, so I was able to like, uh, to you know, get into that, you know. and Eventually, you know, uh, like I said, Freddie was writing songs for us, and you know, next thing you know, I'm playing with little sister, you know, and uh, we're opening shows for Sly. But uh, Larry took a liking to me, and uh, I was still playing with Johnny Talbot at the time. I had just finished touring with the Edwin Hawkins Singers, and I did an album with them called New World. And uh, we came back, and uh, Ed was like. Just be careful, because he knew I was getting ready to get heavily involved in the Sly camp, and he, you know, I'm, I was really proud of my affiliation with that family, and I hope I hold them dear to this to this day. But uh, but we all got on the road and and uh, started opening up shows for Sly and the Family Stone, and I was playing with Johnny Talbot, and every now and then I look out in the club and. Larry would be sitting there checking me out. I'm like, wow, and I start getting nervous, you know. Mm -hmm. I'll be totally relaxed and I'll see him. I'm like, oh man, there's Larry out there. What am I gonna do? You look like a vacation sandwich today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he can take my place yeah. if I need a break. Wow, you know, and mm -hmm. it's funny you say that, man, because yeah. that's what he ended up recommending me to take his place, man. He was like, man, there's this kid I know, man, if I ever leave this band, he is the one I would recommend to take my place, right? Mm. Yeah, and uh, I don't know, I can't remember what show it was, but he had a blue Fender jazz bass with a white pig guard, all binding neck and everything. He gave me that bass. You still have it? I wish I had. <laughs> is that the pond? <laughs> that, man, no, I don't know where happened. What happened to that bass, man? It was kind of like a blue, like that guitar right there. Okay. Um, and he's actually playing that bass on some TV shows. I can't recall the specific TV shows that he's doing, because um, he had a Fender Jazz bass, uh, a Sunburst, but this was a blue uh, Fender Jazz with white pickguard, white binding, and he gave me that bass, man. Wow, that was like, man, the ultimate, like, gift yeah. of love, you know, as far yeah, as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, but, uh, so, yeah, we ended up having a really good relationship, and I remember uh, once we got, you know, in tight with the band, you know, met, you know, Sly and Freddie and everybody, we, we would be able to go to the shows and stand in the wings, you know, and check Sly oh, and yeah, them out. Yeah, all access, yeah, all, all access, exactly. Yeah. And I remember... Uh, vividly, they were at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, and uh, uh, Sly came on, and he was on stage for five or ten minutes, and for some reason, he was like, man, I can't take this, and he walked off the stage, and uh, so we were backstage, and Larry was just furious, man. He had a tambourine. He threw it, man, like a Frisbee, man. He was just pissed, right? I don't know what happened, but from that point, uh, was the beginning of me being uh, considered to uh, replace Larry. But uh, I'll never forget the day that I met Larry, man, and, you know, he's been a beautiful guy ever since I've been knowing him, man. And, you know, he, if I saw him today, man, it would just be hugs and hugs, man, you oh, know what I'm saying? okay, wow. It, yeah, so. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. So, um... So was it a thing like you you already when you I'm trying to imagine the transition. So you you were learning the songs the whole time. So then when the day when the day came for him to ask you to play, you were ready, or how how did all of that happen? Well, playing with Willie Wild and stuff, you know, I mean, he was like a slimy family stone, just you know freak this, you know, just for lack of a better term. So we were playing Sly songs the whole time. You know, we were trying to play higher, and we were trying to play thank you, and, you know, uh, anything that Sly put out, man, we was trying to, you know, emulate. So 
and you know we have Freddie was there, so you know he was giving us guidance. So we were kind of uh -huh. like you know being nurtured by the cats, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, the rest was history, man. So wow. So what what was so let's take us back to your your first day of you playing and and Larry's is on vacation or whatever. Take us to that first day. Like when you sat in and the slides there looking at you like you get you the cat. Well that was that was a <laughs> quite an experience. It was actually on a show in Roanoke, Virginia mm -hmm. in front of like twenty, twenty five thousand people. That was your first gig? That was my first gig. I mean it actually it was the audition because <laughs> because I had uh me and Someone else called Warnell Jones, a bass player that used to play with the Young Senators. He's, he used to back up Eddie Kendricks. Mm -hmm. And then this other dude, this uh, white dude, I, I can't remember what his name was. It's a big fat dude. So each one of us got a chance to play, right? Yeah. And uh, Warnell did good. You know, I'm like, uh oh, this guy's a problem right here. But he did good. And, and then um, I played and. You know, I, I had that feel, I had that thing because I had been around it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, since he looked over and smiled and Sly looked around, he was like, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and after the gig, uh, we were backstage and I heard Sly say, you know what? I'm gonna take the white dude, man. I'm gonna put him in a Santa Claus suit and I'm gonna let him, you know, I'm gonna get everything. <laughs> and I was like, man, I know he can't be serious. Chris Kringle. Yeah. Yeah. He said, man, but you know, Sly was always, you know, um, you know, pushing the envelope like yeah, that, yeah, you yeah. know. So, but I, uh, I ended up getting the gig, so that was cool. Right. So, so wait. So, so take take me back a little further. So. Larry said, I can't make this particular gig, or, I mean, did you know that was an audition, or just, a, you know, was it just a shot? Yeah, I knew it was an audition. I knew Larry wasn't there, because Larry had quit at that point. Larry had, like, you know, you know, he had started. Oh, so Sly knew you were going to be there that night. Well, he, he didn't know I was specific. I guess he knew. I mean, you know, they had to get us plane tickets. Yeah, yeah. You know, so he knew somebody was coming. He didn't know it was me specifically. Uh, he might have had a guess, you know. Gotcha. Larry was developing, at the time, Hot Chocolate, which was uh, going to be his his production until he actually joined the band and created Graham Central Station. Oh, so okay. So Larry was already gone. Mm. But uh, I remember one time we were at, up at Freddie's house and Sly and Bubba stopped by for a minute and... and uh, Sly had to go to the bathroom or something, and I had just left the bathroom, so I'm coming up the hall, he coming down the hall, and I, you know, I didn't even make that eye contact, you know, I just kept on walking, right, and he was like, Bubs, dude didn't even look at me, <laughs> you know, I was like, man, he just, he was just like, I can't believe this guy walked by me and didn't look at me, but then I think that's, some, that triggered something in him that told him something's different about this guy because he ain't just all bowing down yeah, and you know yeah, yeah, yeah. you know so and so when he saw me on the stage I think that plus one more thing is he knew my history with Johnny Talbot and Johnny Talbot was was huge in the Bay Area Sly and Larry and all of them used to come here Johnny's band okay you and know, you were Johnny Talbot's bass player, bass player. that's okay. yeah I, I was playing bass for Johnny in high school so you know uh, uh, Johnny would tell me that you know Sly actually approached some of his band members to join Sly before mm -hmm. Sly ended up with the with the personnel that he ended up with. But uh, Johnny would tell me that they uh, refused because they didn't want to play at Winchester Cathedral at midnight wearing pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> I said they wouldn't have none of that, man. So Winchester Cathedral. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, yeah. So the rest is history, man. And, Man, just just a great experience meeting Larry, man, and I love the guy, and you know. So did Larry ever? Uh, that was it. You, you had the gig from that point. Yeah, I had the gig. That was it. Yeah, that's when we started recording fresh and everything else. So that's a whole nother story, man. You know. Um, mm -hmm. But like Larry, yeah, Larry had a lot to do with me getting in the slide band. Oh, okay. Wow, wow. Yeah. So, so when is the last time you actually talked to Larry? It's been a while. It's been a while. Ago. Um, he played um, um, Yoshi's in San Francisco a few years back. 
Uh, he was in the back room and I got to see him. I had a little band called uh, House Quake and I was playing in the front room and we got to say hello, but that was a few years back now. So it's been a while. But um, yes, yeah, so so that's what we have today. You know, uh, we'll be back um, uh, with another segment of Rusty Allen's Virtual Fan Club. Please come join us. You know, we got some videos we want to release and some giveaways, some tracks we're going to give away and, and some t-shirts and things like that. So stay tuned with us. Come hang with us. There's a lot more to come. Appreciate y'all. Love y'all. Yeah, Rusty Allen. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and stay tuned for more of Rusty Allen's Virtual Fan Club. Peace.